it on? Yeah, it is. Uh, thank you, Lisa and Becca, uh, Rebecca. Uh, if we could just have our morning speakers up. Uh, we're going to do a panel session. Uh, Mark, Jason, Richard, and um, Martin and myself will be on the roving mics. And uh, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand so I know where you are. Um, so there's been some great content this morning. I'm sure you all have got plenty of questions. Um, just a quick one. If I could just ask if you, because we've got a, such a big group, we can have our questions pretty succinct. And also with our guys up the front here, we can have our answers fairly succinct so we can whip through as many questions as we can. That'd be great. It sounds like I'm first. Um, David Coddington from Elders in Narendra. Um, my main question is, if you haven't got that aluminium toxicity, do your principles still say the same, or are you, are you looking to change your figures a little bit? I suppose it, it's all about in the high rainfall zone, but further west, where we still do have acidity, but no aluminium. I think. I think Jason and I will probably both have a comment, but if you think back to one of those diagrams I put up, even at the lower pH, your nutrient availability um, can be greatly influenced by soil pH. So you're right, if there's less aluminium toxicity, that's one constraint. You don't have to worry about sensitive crop or pasture species confronting, but I'd be having a look at your nutrient, um, nutrients and fertility. And the other thing to add to that, um, with uh, rhizobia, they're more sensitive to the acid than the aluminium, the plant's sensitive to the aluminium. So I understand what the soils you're talking about. So one is just make sure that if you've got acid soils that there is no aluminium. You're still going to have trouble with manganese potentially from time to time. And then yeah, just, just be careful with pulses as well because of the rhizobia sensitivity. Uh, Mark, I think it is, I want to ask this question to. Um, Dr. Elaine Ingham, with, uh, you talked of soil biota. It, does the more biology you have in your soil, does that help deal with this issue? Of acidic soil or something? The more biology. I can answer. You can have it first. Certainly the, the higher the organic matter level in soil will directly increase the amount of bi biology that will be active. So, you know, that's where if you've got a soil test and you see your levels of both uh, organic matter or carbon that is definitely below a 2% level, you know, that there will be a, a relative uh, fall off in your biological activity. And it's, I think that's a very, very well proven fact. So a lot of the pasture soils that we, we are testing, you're seeing levels of you know, four to 7%. And uh, PAS started measuring organic matter and carbon, I think nine years ago when they first came out with those tests. And uh, the, the clients are well engaged on that fact. So Lisa's got something else to add. Yeah, with lime, uh, it's a capital investment and the price of it's moved relatively slowly compared to our other inputs in the last 15 to 20 years. But it's not that growers don't ask me, do I have to lime? What if I went biological farming and would that raise my soil pH? In other words, is there an easier way to get it up there? And so if you lift the soil biology, uh, this is according to Dr. Mark Conyers, who's retired now, but um, retired as a principal research scientist with DPI. His view was that soil biology can raise soil pH, but it's temporary. They will revert back down to where they were. And where that time frame is before they go back to sort of a similar pH to where it was is months and years, and, and more with the months. Um, so let's not kid ourselves that 
whether it's a prilled lime or a, a lime application, that is the long-term view of raising soil pH. Yeah, good day. Um, Phil Lyon from Cooter. I've got a question for Richard Hayes. Um, just wondering, are you talking about loosen mixes? I've often had a thought um, saying flares and loosen in pasture mixes. Um, I feel like the flares will outcompete the loosen in a couple of years. I don't know if it's quite on topic, but what's your thoughts on that? Thank you. That's a, <clears throat> it's a good question, and, and it actually came up yesterday as well. One of the one of the issues that we have when we're um, formulating pasture mixes is that we don't have many viable species options, particularly for persistent pastures. So if we're, we're looking for them to persist, we don't have many options and our options decrease the further west we go. So two of the best options that we have in terms of perennial pastures is undoubtedly Lucerne and Phalaris. Um, but they, they aren't, as you quite, li point, quite rightly point out, they're, they're not necessarily completely compatible. So, for example, the grazing regime on them is, is, not, is not the same. So it's very easy to bias one species over the other with management. And I mean, the best example is Lucerne and subclover. Lucerne benefits from rotational grazing. Subclover really doesn't mind being set stocked. Um, and, and Phalaris is a little bit similar, but, but rotational grazing also helps. So the point of, the, point of that is management can bias the mixture and what we found in our network of experiments where we had, we actually had five sites where we had, you know, Lucen, Phalaris, Subclover. We actually found that at some sites Lucen dominated and at other sites Phalaris dominated. Some of that was due to management, although we tried to keep management the same. Some of it was actually also due to soil type. So, so inevitably with our pasture mixes we will have one species dominating over another. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to sort of maintain that balance, knowing that we don't actually have that many species options to choose from. So I, I think it, it's just an ongoing challenge. I think you can manage it, uh, and, and it's easier to manage in some soils than others. I might just jump in and say I think it's a really on-topic question, trying to get that perennials and versus annuals and then which perennials. So something we haven't talked about today is fodder budgeting. But looking at where is that feed requirement that you have with your livestock operations? So are you wanting more winter spring feed or are you wanting more spring summer autumn feed? And because they will compete with each other, trying to get that sowing rate right from the beginning where you actually say, I want a Phalaris dominant pasture and I'm going to put some lucerne in, or I want a lucerne dominant pasture because I need that summer feed and putting less phalaris in. Uh, Tim from Juni, uh, question for you, Jason. Just wondering if we're getting those liming rates um, up to your pHs above five and a half, what, what sort of uh, rate are you getting that excess lime to move down through the profile? So the answer to that question is depends on what the pH of the soil is. So that example I gave you, which was lo local south of here, where they put eight tonnes on, they needed eight tonnes because their starting point was four, right? So our, in all of our trials, we've got those pH targets and the rates vary depending on what your starting pH is and then your buffering capacity of the soil. So they range from um, three tonnes to uh, seven tonnes in just off the top of my head. Uh, for those for those trials to get up over you know to get up near six, is that, is that what you're after? Oh, just probably wondering uh, how how what sort of rate is that excess line moving down through your profile once you've got past that that 5.5? Rate is in centimetres pH change per centimetre. Is that what you mean? Yeah, or is it taking is it taking a year to move down a centimetre? Two years? Yeah. Um, for the work that we've done, we're still sampling, we're still going. I, off the top of my head, I can't answer that question with a data set, right? But the data that I showed you from that, that same trial where they use eight tonnes, uh, you know, you were getting significant pH change uh, over a, a five year period. The uh, work that Guandi published 
from the master site in the 10 to 20 centimetre layer, and that was a that was a, um, a roughly a 0.9 pH unit change in that layer uh, over an 18 year period. So that didn't happen overnight. It wasn't a perfectly straight line, but it was a, a general trend up. It's yeah. interesting. I'll just um, jump in. It's interesting when we think, when we're talking about acidification and we talk about reacidification, because I said before it was a process and it's ongoing all the time to do with the production system itself. So if you just think about a paddock that you know, maybe go home and look at a soil test tonight, say it's 5.2, across crop or pasture enterprises, in two years' time, it's going to be about 5.1. That's it without you doing anything different. And so that drop is continuing to happen. So I understand the question was about, you know, how quickly it's moving, but I just thought I'd share a little bit of information about what's what's normal in terms of reacidification. On that on that, this is turning into a jump around, but uh, people are doing stuff, so I know where you're talking what the information you're talking about, Lisa. So the information that we've got about acidification rates is historic, right? And so we do stuff now, we grow dual purpose canola, hit it up with a heap of urea, graze it heavily, and then harvest the grain from it. In my mind, that is the most acidifying thing that we can do. It's great for money, right? And everyone wants to be productive, I'm for it, but it has a great acidification rate. We don't know what it is. Right? So you are doing it. You are the ones that can find out what your rate of acidification is. And the way you do that is sample, do your practice, sample again. The duration between those sampling events is up to you to decide. Personally, for me, it would be like two years, three years, right? But if you're doing it, just think of those graphs I showed you through time. If you've got a data point every two years, you've got real definition there. You can see what you're doing. You can see what you're doing to your soil. If it's a, dot, a data point every 10 years, man, like you're gonna find yourself in a situation that you were dealing with before you know you've got data to support the evidence that you're dealing with it. Yeah. Um, we talk about lime equivalents. So a tonne of lucerne hay has a lime equivalent of about 70 kilos. So, you know, if you jumped up, you know, again, like Jason was saying, that really productive enterprise of that grazing canola has lime equivalent. It's just that we're not quantifying at the moment for you to see how much you'd need to put back for what you actually got out of it. Oh, just, just a comment for the uh, long-term experiment at uh, Master Book Book. So the Lamont uh, over 20 years is roughly sort of uh, uh, one centimeters per year. So that's the moment. Oh, I'm Guan Di Li, the uh, principal research scientist uh, work at Waga here. Stacy <laughs> Tumut. That's working, yeah. Uh, past your research to any speaker, any developments with uh, more acid tolerance grasses and pastures? Um, the most, the, the, well, the best work that was done was in the former CSIRO Phalaris breeding program, uh, where there was a concerted effort over 20 years to, to develop Phalaris varieties that are more uh, acid soil tolerant. That program unfortunately is now finished but, but there are a couple of varieties. Uh, I think Advanced AT was the last of those varieties which, which actually was released 10 years ago so it's not that new. Um, there, there is also um, work on the acid tolerant lucerne. Um, that's with heritage seeds and out of Sardi. Uh, those guys um, have been working on it for quite some time. They and and they were trying to combine the improved acid soil tolerance of loosened varieties with more acid tolerant loosened rhizobia. Uh, they have released a product out of that, but I haven't been able to evaluate it yet, so I can't tell you how good it was. 
Um, Jason, could I just get your thoughts on um, the use of a subsoil plough around the contours prior to broadcasting lime, um, as opposed to just broadcasting over the surface? And, and if you were going down to like maybe you know 200, 250 mil uh, at probably 250 mil spacings. So you're you're ploughing into 20 centimetres deep on yeah. the contour over the entire paddock? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, the two things that come to mind, one is whenever you mix soil in deep, like so soil stratified, there can be bad things down there too that you don't want coming up. So before you mix soil in, you need to know, do you have bad layers? Now, for our systems, those bad layers would probably be a sodic layer is what's coming to mind because you bring that to the surface and then you get you 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 will wear that for many years to come uh, so that's one and two is the erosion risk that comes with that cultivation and that's a decision that from my point of view anyway like that a landholder makes because it's they wear the consequences um, in terms of mixing lime in there's no doubt incorporation of lime is you know, cultivation to incorporate lime works and it's faster than waiting for it to, to move through um, just nat naturally. But it, that's the trade-off. Is that, yep? Yeah, no, uh, uh, yeah uh, Joe Kingston from The Rock. Um, one for you, Jason. Um, when it comes to incorporating lime, what, how intense are you talking? Like you did say, no one's getting out the rotary hoe. Um, but mainly for a three tonne to the hectare liming event, what are we talking? And then once we do get above that 5.5 and just come back with maintenance lime, are we still talking the same kind of intense incorporation or will a sowing operation be sufficient enough? Yep, so uh, data-free observation, except for the master trial, the, the, the maintenance liming, master shows that it's effective as a surface application, incorporate by sow, you know, it would be a little bit of a win on top of that. So that's what I would, I would do. Um, so the best method to incorporate, so work that was done by Brendan Scott and Mark Conyers on that uh, showed offset discs is good, like disking is good. Uh, scarifying isn't as good. Multiple scarify is better than a one pass, right? Uh, and they also showed that, or in a different piece of work, that uh, for most, or for many soils that don't have an erosion risk, that cultivation doesn't have any long-term negative. Okay, so if you're on on no till, been no tilling for a long time, and that's why I like doing it, a one-off incorporation to get lime and to get to that head start in pH amelioration doesn't have any long-term structural negatives and from the work that we've done in, in, in the trials that we've got active at the moment I would say that uh, one of the observations is is that mixing and in some of those places they are have a history of no-till um, actually mixing is a really good like cultivation is a really good practice uh, you you see it when you walk the plots you get these patchy ones and then you get these nice uniform growth plots and they're the ones that have been had an incorporation um, treatment with or without lime, right? And so our no-till practicing practices is good for structure, I get it, but what it also does, I'll show you about pH stratification. Soil carbon stratified, coal P, phosphorus availability is stratified. All these things are stratified, largely driven by the carbon, the organic matter. And so uh, because the carbon stratified, the bugs, the microbes are stratified as well. And so mixing is actually a really good thing to do periodically. Not every year, but if you're going to lime, get a, get a head start with that lime movement, apply your three tons and incorporate it in, then, then that mixing is, you get a lot of benefit from that, as long as you're not on a slope that's gonna wash it off, yeah? So um, it comes down to what, what implements you've got on, on hand um, to, to, to do it. So, but discs are great. And just just the importance of soil moisture with that incorporation, that if you want to preserve that soil structure, you know, that it's not too wet and not too dry. 
Uh, Jim um, Macketh at Wagga, just a quick question for Mark Lucas. Um, Mark, on those non-arable hill slopes, the aerial application sort of country, what, what are the big sort of three opportunities that, um, that you've seen really yield big results? Or one? <laughs> I think that you know there's two there's two levels to that. One, we haven't resolved it in New Zealand. They use coarse a coarse lime over there as a uh, a manual uh, an input at an every uh, like decade or more. But you know they're a more intensive system. We I think that the discovery will be that it'll be a pelletised product going out and probably at low rates. I can't see that the economics on running hill country at, at lighter stocking rates is going to allow us to be putting large amounts of money into there. But the the work hasn't been done. I'd only be double guessing. But, um, you know, just from maybe yesterday, if you put out a couple of hundred kilos or something similar as a, as a cow cipral, but you've got to identify, you know, where you are in the spectrum of your pH and in all honesty, I don't think that we've been tracking our hill country well enough. We keep our phosphorus light levels right. Um, and, you know, if you do that and you keep your biology right, um, you know, your three parts there. And, you know, during droughts, we've got to protect, you know, steeper slope country. So maintaining, you know, or putting those cattle, cattle or sheep in a containment area is a very, very smart thing to do. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you know you've got good research uh, people in, employed here that uh, it will be part of the initiation of trying to look after long term the 40 per cent of country that contributes through tablelands and slopes to very very positive you know um, livestock production that is not trafficable so maybe Lisa's next little program could be in fact that. I've got, a men I've got a mental picture of Mark's client's hills with the helicopter flying over and they're liming but it actually looks like it's snowing. <laughs> <laughs> they can't put a shield on those uh, lime spreaders. No, um, but probably look there's a preponderance of reference back to soil testing. Um, lime, you've got to remember Lime country will always be preferentially grazed by livestock. So as soon as your lime country, it does sweeten it up. And, you know, there's a body of evidence to support you get superior weight gain and more importantly, you'll get superior carcass shield, particularly in, uh, in lamb. So it's a win-win. Uh, that's not been spoken of today. You know, so the, I think the science at, at at the level that you've heard today and then the application of it and your back pocket there's a bigger win as well as the animals preferential grazing. Um, hi <coughs> Trish from Brambler. I just wanted to ask you um, uh, given your focus on the lower levels the subsurface levels of um, pH is the, uh, do you getting bang for your bucks by putting out lime in a no tillage system where you're not incorporating it? And if, and if you are, is there a, a maximum point, a, an ideal point of time when you would apply that? Like, do you have to have soil moisture there when you apply the lime? Or is it okay to put it out in a dry, bare paddock? Look, I think a few of us could make comments, given it's the last question for this forum. So in terms of bang for your buck, um, how do I describe a slow bang? Um, that if we get, if we have this goal in mind, that five and a half or above, trying to, whether you're putting out less lime more regularly or more lime at the beginning if it hasn't been done, knowing that it's going to take some time to both work chemically and it's going to start working faster if it hasn't been done before at that lower pH. But then to move down to depth will take 
seasons. It's not just going to happen in one season. And Gwande, you know, said that that was at about a centimetre a year. Remembering that the top 10 had been worked on the master site, but below had not been, and it was still moving to depth at a centimetre per year. So that's not, in terms of an investment, it's very much that long-term investment with immediate improvements that are ongoing and continuing to increase. Just to add to that, so it uh, depends a bit on what you're growing and how sensitive that is to the acidity, right, and the value of that, whatever it is that you're growing. The data that I showed you from Matt Lischke's Lagan trial, that was two tonnes of lime applied to the surface, no incorporation onto um, perennial pastures with a clover uh, component. And within, um, within a year or two years, they were up around an extra DSE carrying capacity. Uh, I showed you there the last set of data, so it's over four years and they're now up around two and a half to three DSE and a gross margin gain of $180. So that's a pretty rapid return on the investment uh, in a pasture system. Now, his work showed that that production gain was driven by the clover response. So if you didn't have the clover, you may be not having those same numbers. So yeah, how long it takes to start getting a gain in production depends on what you're growing, what your system is, but it's there, the data shows that it, it's there. Okay. We, might, um, we might pull that up session up there. Um, we don't want to take up too much time of lunch. Great, uh, some great questions coming, coming through. We could just thank our panel of speakers, please. And this is going to be a really awkward moment. We're going to give a present to uh, a, a gift to Mark for his time today and yesterday and sharing his experience. Thanks, mate. No worries. Um, Thank uh, you. The other guys are all part of the team, so uh, they're he he here for the love of it. <laughs> so, sorry, guys.